uh, it was funny. I remember you saying to me this morning, you felt a bit like a relic coming back here for the uh, for the groundbreaking. And I told you, you're not a relic, you're a part of history. But as a high school kid, you know, coming down here working, you literally did everything. You know, wherever they sent you that day, that was what you did. That was all for the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm sure a lot of high school kids have had that same experience yeah. of being gopher for the day. Yeah. But what was it like working in a massive place like this, a place that is this large and that was this well known in the town, and with all of these older fellows that you know, probably were parents of kids you grew up with, what was it like to work here? Well, uh, it was a Primarily a fun thing to do. Was it? Yeah. I don't remember being overly awed by the uh, <laughs> facility, but uh, sheets of uh, steel would come in, mm -hmm. and then they would be brought down that direction uh, to be hydraulically punched out. At, then, at what point does it start to get married to the handle? I think that was the term. Uh, well, first of all, you have to go all the way down here and take a left. Okay. Well, let's say that was. Uh, I noticed that that's pretty well ripped out. Yeah, of oh, the end there, yeah. Yeah, but that was a major area of uh, heat treatment of the... Uh, of the metal? Of the metal, yeah. Uh -huh. And that building, which was at that time, was all glass. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, so smoky that you couldn't see halfway down the building. Really? Not to think about. Now, smoke from the process. Correct. Okay. They didn't have ventilation. O o o o OSHA would have closed the place down in the microsite. <laughs> yeah. I can imagine. Uh, so I'm not sure how many people never made old age because of it, but mm. uh, nobody gave it a thought. And this whole area here was all assembly. This was assembly. Yeah, and this is where they did the steam. We meet today on this unique site to celebrate a new beginning for these buildings and to commemorate their history, their central role in the development of Easton, of Massachusetts, and of the nation, and their continued evolution as integral parts of our community's fabric. Five years ago, this historic site was under imminent threat of demolition. The backhoe was literally at the doorstep. Yet thanks to a community whose citizens truly treasure our history and understand the value of our past as a character-defining feature, this town chose another path. The site's about eight acres with uh, originally more than a dozen buildings. We're preserving all of the buildings that were built during the 1800s along with the skeleton of this uh, metal building that was built in 1928. We're thrilled to be part of, of this history that goes back to the middle of the 19th century and it's really an honor to be involved in the adaptive reuse, really the rejuvenation of this site. In 1803, Oliver Ames and his wife Susanna moved from West Bridgewater, moving into a home and modifying a small bankrupt nail making shop just across Shovel Shop Pond from where we sit today. This first Ames shovel factory grew and expanded as it supplied the growing nation with tools. Tools which literally built America's towns and cities, its farms and its infrastructure. In January 1853, this building, the Long Shop, was completed, replacing wooden buildings across the pond which burned in a devastating fire the night of March 2nd, 1852. Ames shovels continued to dominate the market for their reputation for quality and diversity of types. Shovels branded Ames were in the calloused hands of men laying rails crossing the nation, a transcontinental railroad in part funded by the, part, by the profits from this very factory. Ames shovels were wielded by brawny, native-born and immigrant laborers toiling underground and in the hot sun and aside the fiery, smoke-belching furnaces of Pittsburgh and Cleveland, into which they fed coal and iron ore by the shovelful, and at the dusty grain elevators scooping corn, wheat, and flour. Just think of the millions of tons of dirt moved by tools made right here that provided our nation with California gold, Michigan copper, and the coal of West Virginia. 
And Ames developed specialty tools for the military as well, supplying entrenching tools to every American conflict, perhaps as early as Bunker Hill, huge quantities for the Civil War, and into the modern period. Many a soldier literally owes his life to an Ames shovel. With this huge demand, this factory expanded and evolved, and each building tells a story not only about the development of Ames shovels, not only about the Ames family, but of the evolution of American industrial and business history. So One thing that I did here that was kind of horrific. What's this? I went on strike. You went on strike? I went on strike. Here? Yep. No kidding. What? I, no, tell me about that. This, other, this other fellow, a, a, a schoolmate of mine. Yep. It was a hot June day. Yeah. And we were unloading the coal car. Yeah. And we decided, let's stop and have a coke. <laughs> so we got a coke and we sat down on the edge of the coal car. Yeah. And we're taking our sweet time. <laughs> and the uh, engineer in charge of the uh, boiler room. Uh huh was worried that he wasn't going to get his proper quantity of coal inside yep. ready to run the thing at night. Yep. So he got out and used not nice language yeah. to move us on. And we sort of replied in kind. <laughs> <laughs> Some also not nice language. And so we yeah. sat down and uh, the next thing we knew Foreman, who was a fellow by the name of uh, Mr. Gurney, uh -huh. uh, came down and looked at us. And, uh, said, you know, you guys are going to get back to work when we get ready. Yeah, yeah. And so by the time we were through, we had everybody, including the superintendent of the facility, down. <laughs> Waiting for you guys to go back to work. Waiting for us to go back to work. So then finally we went back to work. We did our thing. Yeah. However, I had to go home. And, and face your I dad. Face my father. Yeah, because he obviously had heard about this. Yes. <laughs> and uh, this was not a union shop. And yeah. We had no union type of. Uh, yeah, no regulations. Attitudes. Yeah. Right. Whatsoever. Yeah. And, uh, so I didn't have a pleasant supper that night. <laughs> <laughs> that was your your couple of hours strike, huh? Right. <laughs> How about your, uh, how about your uh, colleague, the other fellow who was sitting having a coke with you? How did he make out a dinner that night? His father didn't work here. Oh, <laughs> so he didn't know about it.
This project's being done under the National Park Service's standards for historic rehabilitation. So all of our designs, windows, the uh, new, new doors, new openings into the building, all that needs to be vetted by the Park Service in Washington, D.C., and was as part of our design process before we commenced construction. I freely admit that I'm thrilled by the Beacon Project, but I think it is worth pointing out that Northeastern is already a special place. Its energetic cultural community is set among some historically and architecturally important buildings. We could not have been able to apply for funding if we had not had a project we needed funding for. Over four years ago, our community faced a problem. We had a choice to make. I think it's important to note that this wasn't a choice between this project or the status quo. It was a choice between this project or the possible destruction of some or all of the historic features of this site. Easton did what it does best. Yeah. Yeah. 20, 30, 50 years down the road, residents of Eastern are going to look back and say, this was a point in time where we did something really big, really important. We came together, we made it happen. When you think back to the work, and you were here probably, what, three or four years part-time? Yeah. Right. What was the best of it, and what was the worst of it? To having that kind of a job when you're 14, 15, 16 14, years 15. old. 14, 15. Well, plus payday was pretty much the top of the that list. That was the best but. of it, yep. Yeah. Uh, I used to enjoy doing the uh, testing, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I think partly it was the going around, stupid thing, but it was uh, times I had to collect the Coke bottles. Really? Tell me about that. They would, the go, they would have these small Coke machines yep. and uh, put up, they were nickel at the time. I was going to say, pop a nickel in, yeah. And people would take a, the Coke back to their workstation mm -hmm. and then leave the bottles. Yeah. So I had a little trolley. You know, just paralyzed the whole facility. This is yeah. probably gave me the opportunity to see everything sure. and go everywhere. Sure, yeah. And uh, so as you go to different areas, mm. stop and talk, and uh, people were congenial. Yep. And uh, that was a pleasant uh, occupation or pastime. As yeah, you and I'm sure you got to be pretty well known too. It's like, oh, yeah, here, here Boy, comes. I was Andrew's kid. <laughs> <laughs> here comes Andrew's kid collecting the Coke bottles. Yeah. What was the worst of it? What do you look back on and say, gosh, that was awful? Uh, I hated unloading the coal cars. And uh, I think that, although it gave me incentive to do better in later years. Yeah, yeah, so I'm going to get an education and do something besides unload yeah. coal cars. They came in on the siding out there. Yes, yeah. But it, it just seemed so pointless that yeah. once you unloaded it, then there was another one, and then yeah. you did the same thing. And then there was another one. Ad nauseum. At the rear of the room is a, is a bell that was removed from the cupola of the machine shop just a few weeks ago. Today we're going to ring the bell to celebrate this event, but in 1857 when it was installed and actually into the early 1970s and by a bell preceding it, it sort of marked the time for here in Easton. See how much I've changed.